Good morning. Tell you what, for the last month we've been giving you all curveballs. You probably don't know if we're going to do announcements or greet each other or do the announcements at the end or start with the preaching and end with singing. Who, who knows? Um, it'll be normal for the rest of the service after this. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just want to have another opportunity for prayer. Uh, you know, I recently read an article and it was kind of moving to me of, you know, only 25% of people who grow up Christian uh, remain Christian into adulthood. And they did a study and there, there's a few reasons why that is the case. But one of the key factors in those 25% of people who remain Christians is they have a dedicated uh, God-centered person in their life that is not their parent who challenges them to the gospel. Um, Fortunately, in my life, I've been blessed to have several. Uh, one of them uh, is a, someone who's not of my generation, but I would consider a good friend. Uh, his name was Dave Wilson. Uh, he passed away yesterday, so definitely be praying for him. Uh, to give you guys some understanding, Dave Wilson was a successful businessman here in Indiana. Uh, he was a CFO of a major corporation, uh, chose to retire, and typically when people retire, they, they choose to be closer to their grandkids, closer to their family. Uh, Dave Wilson was moved on a mission trip to Ecuador because so many people there were hungry for the gospel, but nobody was there to share it with them. Uh, so he decided instead of retiring and being close to grandkids, he was going to retire and move to Ecuador uh, with his wife and, and shared the gospel there for years and years. And I consider it a little bit tragic, but I, I know he didn't feel the same way. When he finally decided to go home, he found out that he had cancer shortly after returning to the United States. And I got to be with him you know, a few months back and talk to him. And I, I was thinking the conversation was gonna be like, oh my goodness, you have, you have cancer, you know, how is it going? And all he could talk about, even knowing he was in his final days, was, was sharing the gospel with people. And I remember he's sitting there and he's, he's getting his house converted to make it more accessible for him because he has cancer and he has this team that's coming to help uh, build things. And he told me, you know, Brian, I'm, I told them I would pay them extra if for half a day while they're clocked in, they all have to sit in my living room and I share the gospel to them. And he paid a whole team to sit there and listen to him present the gospel. And he says, Brian, I'm gonna do it next Friday at three o'clock and I want you at three o'clock to be, be praying. And so that, that's the life you know, Dave Wilson lived. Some of the first sermons I ever preached was in Ecuador because of the influence of Dave Wilson, and many of us have, have been there. So he is in heaven now, and certainly uh, many more people will be in heaven as a result of the work that he did. So let's just take a moment and pray. Dear Father, we just uh, come to you today thankful for the life of David Wilson. Understand that he is now in a place where he is with you, and sees you face to face, he, he no longer understands pain or loss. Uh, just pray for his family, pray for his wife Deb, that you would uh, bring her comfort, and just pray for the many people all across the world who are mourning his death today. Uh, just pray for me as I preach. I know I'm only capable of a failure. I just ask that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me not to fail in your name, amen. Uh, so, the next three weeks uh, is kind of the advent. We're in the Christmas season, and we're doing a little bit of a three-week mini-series called What Child Is This? Uh, my particular week is God With Us. But next week, you'll get to hear Luke go through the Gospel of Luke. And then the following week, you'll get to hear Matthew go through the Gospel of Matthew. And this week, you get to hear Brian go through John. So... <laughs> Uh, but before we do that, I, kind of like a, a verse that stuck out to me as I've studied this is in 1 Kings 8, 26 and 27. So let's go ahead and read that. It says, Now, Lord God of Israel, please confirm what you promised to your servant, my father David. 
But will God indeed live on earth? Even heaven, the highest heaven, cannot contain you, much less this temple I have built. Uh, So Solomon has just built this temple for God, the Holy Spirit, to be able to come down and dwell. And he poses a question uh, that we're going to answer as a church over the next three weeks. Will God indeed live on earth? Uh, that gets answered in the Gospels. And today we're going to be diving into uh, the Gospel of John. And although I did not get a good Christian name like Matthew and uh, Luke here, my father thought it would be more appropriate to name me after a professional arm wrestler in a movie. <laughs> and that's, that's a true fact. My middle name is Lincoln because of this Sylvester Stallone movie called Over the Top in which the main character's name is Lincoln Hawk. And so if you were to go to my house on Christmas, my family calls me Link or Lincoln. Uh, but we'll pretend for this week in the sake of it, it's, it's John. Because I find myself, if I could relate to one of the authors of the gospel, it is certainly John. Uh, John is, you know, he's given the nickname one of the sons of thunder by Jesus. He's kind of got a bold personality, a little bit of, you know, I would call it confidence. Maybe some others would even call it arrogance in his personality and his writing style. But then the book of John is this tender book about the life of Jesus. So here's a a few verses in John that really stuck out to me that kind of show his personality a little bit. It says, one of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close besides Jesus. You see, John is so humble that he doesn't want to name himself in his book, but he calls himself something much better than his own name. I'm the one Jesus loved. Out of all these disciples, Jesus loved me. In fact, Jesus, dude, when we're reclining and we're just chilling, it's, it's me and Jesus, right? And then another, another verse that stuck out to me, it says, as the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. I don't know how this is necessary to the gospel story, but John wanted people to know that when John and Peter were running together, John was faster, he beat him, <laughs> he got there first. Uh, and then another kind of showing is boldness. In, in the Gospel of Luke, there's a story about John and a, a few of the others. And we look through 52 through 55. It says, He sent messengers ahead of him, and on the way he entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But they did not welcome him, because he was determined to journey to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, he said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Uh, but he turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Uh, I remember when I was in the military and I was in Afghanistan, it was a pretty tough time. And I remember me and my buddy Shane Richardson, very close friend I still have, when we were getting on the helicopter that they were going to fly us out of Afghanistan with, uh, the Taliban was shooting at us to get while we were trying to get on the helicopter. And we sat down and looked at each other and we're like, man, they could just nuke this place and I would probably be okay with that. And you see John here saying, hey, Jesus, they rejected you in this city. Have you considered maybe like blowing the city up? We could call down fire to heaven to consume them. Uh, And and Jesus rebukes them. So that's how I think uh, John sticks out to me. Uh, The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're referred to as synoptic Gospels. It's three camera angles telling the same story from a different perspective. And then John is kind of unique that he chose the story in a much different light than the other three. Uh, So we're going to look through that today, starting uh, with John 1, and we're going to read 1 through 5. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. This is a bit of a tricky passage because it's translated the English and it isn't written in English. So when you see, in the beginning was the word, 
our natural assumption is, oh, this must be in reference to the Word of God, the, the Bible. But if you notice, it's, it's capitalized and it's referring to a person. In the beginning of time was the Word. And what was the Word? The Word was with God and the Word was God. So some of the names in the Old Testament that they used for God, because they had such a great reverence and fear for who he was, they were scared almost to call him by his full name. And you see, you know, Eli, uh, El Shaddai, and one of the words that's commonly used is Logos to refer to the name of God. So Logos translated directly to English is word, the word. Uh, so when we see this, it is a reference to Jesus. In the beginning, when life was created, Jesus was there. Uh, so with that in mind, you have to really look at all the events that took place that you need to have an understanding that Jesus was there for these moments already. Sure, we are celebrating his birth, you know, Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem, but he was there and existed long before that. Uh, so if you look at Genesis, uh, you can see that God saw that all he had made and it was very good. Evening came and then morning the sixth day. So when God created the world and he created it perfect, picture Jesus there in that moment as well. And, and it's a bit tricky, right? Because we're monotheistic. We believe in one God, but then we believe in a trinity and it's three parts. And I, I don't have a great explanation for you other than one time it was kind of explained to me like this and maybe it'll help you understand. Like I'm Brian. I'm one person. I'm one man, right? And I have a dad. His, his name's Rick. And to my dad, I'm Brian the son. I'm me, but he calls me son. We went to a basketball game yesterday with Luke, and you know I played the role of Brian the son. And then before that, I had to wake up really early yesterday and pick my daughter up from a gymnastics sleepover. And so she's probably the only person more tired than me today because she's like, I didn't sleep at all. Uh, but to her, I'm Brian dad. She calls me dad, and she's sweet, and she wakes up, and she gives me a big hug. And when I'm Brian the son, I don't get big hugs from people. But when I'm Brian dad, one person, two roles, right? Then I went to work yesterday, and I got to be like Brian, you know, the guy on the window making sure the food looked good, right? So I'm one man, Brian the father, Brian the son, Brian, the guy making the food look good. Three roles, one person, right? So we see this here, right? So God the Father, God the Son are there at the creation of the world. Uh, so initially it's perfect, but it does not stay that way for very long. We're going to move on to Genesis 3. It says, the Lord God made clothing out of skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. The Lord God said... Since man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out. Take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him on his way from the Garden of Eden to work on the ground which he has taken. He drove man out, of, out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming whirling sword in the east of the Garden of Eden to guard the tree of life. So we see the first sin take place in Genesis 3, and we then immediately see the understanding for a sacrifice of blood has to be made in order for that relationship to be restored. So it says, the Lord God made clothing out of skins. Uh, so we see an animal that did no wrong have to be sacrificed to cover up Adam and Eve's sin. So something perfect, had to die as a sacrifice, and Jesus is there in that moment. Uh, we see it again in Scripture, uh, in Exodus. So go to Exodus 12, 5 through 7. It says, You must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. 
They must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. So here is uh, the book of Exodus. Uh, and the next slide, it continues on. It says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. I am Yahweh. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be dis a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So once again, we see a unblemished, perfect creature, either a lamb or a goat, being sacrificed so that blood can pay an atonement to prevent death, right? So we've got uh, the, the Exodus is the Israelite people. At this time, they're in captivity in Egypt from the pharaohs. And there's plagues. And the last plague is that he's promising to kill the firstborn son of every family in Egypt, with the exception of those who have put blood on their doorposts. And Jesus is there in this moment. He didn't just start in Bethlehem. In the beginning was the word. He's there as sin has entered the world and understands once again that a perfect sacrifice has to be made, that blood will then pay atonement, and death will be prevented. Jesus is there in that moment. Uh, so go back to John 1. It says, there was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So we get back to John and we see John is talking about a man named John. But if you remember, I told you, John doesn't mention himself ever in his gospel. So when we talk about this John, you need to understand this is a different John, not John the disciple, uh, but John, we refer to John the Baptist, the harbinger of Christ. And a harbinger is someone who goes before someone else announcing the arrival of that person, right? In American history, we have that with a man named Paul Revere, right? He, he goes on his ride and warns all the colonies, the British are coming, the British are coming, right? He's the person going before the British to announce their arrival, although everybody was British at the time, so that's probably not what he said, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but that's what John is. He's going before Jesus, Hey, there's a man who is coming. I'm not the light, but this man is the light. Uh, John has a long-standing relationship, John the Baptist, with Jesus. So much so that they were actually together when they were both in the womb, but in separate wombs. So let's look at Luke 1, and we'll read 39 through 42. It says, In those days Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zachariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside of her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, you are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. So you see John the Baptist in the womb. When Mary enters, Mary is pregnant with Jesus, and John is also in the womb. He leaps for joy when he is near Jesus, even in the womb. So that's the relationship that John the Baptist has with Jesus. Uh, so when he says, I'm not the one, he knows who the one is. So we're going to read 14 uh, through 18 of John 1. It says, the word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory and the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and explained, this was the one whom I said, the one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came to Jesus, oh, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only son, the one who is at his father's side has revealed to him. 
So he's explaining the word that was here from the beginning, like Solomon asked, became flesh. Jesus was born. Even though he was there from the beginning, he took flesh, he resided with us. We observed his glory. Um, the one and only Son, the one and only God coming down to earth. And although people are saying that John the Baptist is this great man, he's saying that this man has surpassed me in every way. He's existed long before me. Uh, reading John 1, 19, it says, this is the testimony, uh, this is John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? He did not refuse to answer, but he declared, I am not the Messiah. What then, they asked him, are you Elijah? I am not, he said. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Who are you then, they asked. We need to give an answer about those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself, he said. He said, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord just as Isaiah the prophet said. He's once again proclaiming to the Jews, I need you to understand you're giving me this credit, but I am not the one who is worthy of credit. I am just the one coming before. Uh, I'm not Elijah, I'm not Moses, I'm not God, uh, but I am the one coming out from the wilderness. Prepare yourself. The Lord is coming, just as Isaiah prophesied. Continuing on with 24, it says, Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, so they asked him, Why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone who stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. All this happened in Bethany across Jordan where John was baptizing. We just got to witness baptism. It's, it's certainly an exciting time, right? And uh, as we were baptizing here, right, we, we did it with, with water, right? That act itself is symbolic of what has happened. It isn't necessarily salvation in and of itself, right? Similarly, John is saying, I'm, I'm doing the baptizing, uh, but I do it with water. I'm, I'm not saving. I'm just obeying this ordinance to, to baptize. Uh, but there's, there's someone who's coming, uh, and he's going to do the actual saving in the same way what I'm doing is symbolic. I'm not even worthy uh, to untie this man's sandal strap. And so I, I, I often think of that. We, we celebrate the baptism, but we celebrate the salvation that came from Jesus. And we are celebrating that public you know, declaration. And it's certainly something to be excited about. It says, in the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who has surpassed me, but he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I watched the spirit descending like a dove and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. So he's announced that Jesus is coming, and then Jesus is there. And he is someone completely fearless, and we learn he even like loses his head over confronting sin. But he calls out to the people before uh, Jesus has turned water into wine, before he's began his missionary, before he's raised the dead. But he points and says, this man is God, and the same way that I save with water, he is the one that actually is going to save you. Um, you can see that the Spirit descending is resting on. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. 
So we see this relationship of Jesus here. He's, he's been born, he was born in Bethlehem, but he's always there. And from the beginning, he saw a perfect creation. He saw that perfect creation get ruined through sin. He was there and understood that that sin required a perfect sacrifice. We saw it with Adam and Eve. We see it again with uh, the Israelites, that perfect sacrifice. And then we get to see it for the final time in the book of John as well, in John 19. It says, verse 28 says, After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished with the scripture that might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they fixed the sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Uh, it's, it's something that we, we have, as a staff really find interesting is everybody's favorite holiday is Christmas. And it's funny because even though we say, we understand as a, a pastoral staff that we're commanded to remember his death and the fact that he resurrected. And then we all got together for like a staff bonding time and we played this game of how well do you know your spouse? And one of the questions is what is your spouse's favorite holiday? And unanimous, all of us and all our wives, we all said Christmas. Uh, but you need to understand that Christmas is symbolic of Christ's coming, but it's his death and his burial and his resurrection. The understanding of that there needs to be a perfect sacrifice and we can't achieve it. And he saw it all throughout scripture and he chose to come to earth and be that sacrifice. That is what's special behind Christ's coming. And I love the story of him being born, and I love when I sit around the Christmas tree, and I don't love singing carols, but that's part of it. And I love opening the presents, right? And I don't know if you guys ever got told, like, oh, Jesus only got three presents, so you should only get three presents. And the counter argument is, well, Jesus got gold. So if you're willing to give me gold, I'm, I'm willing to accept only three presents. And that is fun, and that is great. And Jesus was born, and it's a wonderful thing. But the fact that he was the ultimate sacrifice that we see all throughout the Old Testament finally fulfilled. That is what is special about Jesus coming. And that is the reason for the season. And I just ask as you guys are going and you're celebrating Christmas and you're thinking about his birth, understand that it's his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That that's what's special and that's what needs to be uh, remembered with this season. Uh, so I hope I delivered on my promise to Coda on this being a short sermon. I think this is one of my shortest, but that's, that's all I have for you guys. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to, to get together and just study your word. I'm thankful for John and his unique perspective that he wrote. Um, I just pray that you know we, we would be like John the Baptist, that we would talk about Jesus' second coming and the fact that he is coming back and we would be the people who would announce that. Just pray that we would, we would be like David Wilson who, who goes and shares the gospel to people and just pray one day that when I'm up in heaven that somebody can say, you know, I'm, I'm there because of the, the life you lived and the fact that you weren't afraid to share God and pray that we'd all have that perspective. Uh, just pray as we celebrate Christmas that we rejoice in your birth and we rejoice in your death and your burial and your resurrection. In your name, amen.